Hey, today we're kicking off a new series called Fear Not. And um, what we see is uh, in the Christmas story, in the events uh, leading up to the Christmas story, four different times, people have encounters with angels. And, and the first thing the angel says to that person is they say, don't be afraid or fear not. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at those moments where these angels uh, tell us not to be afraid. And, and I'm excited about this because I, I, I think that that we live in a moment where far too many of us kind of go through life with kind of a low-grade fear, just kind of going through life afraid. I feel, I feel like in many ways, fear is the spirit of the age. I, I, I feel like social media propagates this. I feel like 24-hour news propagates this. Hey, guys, I'm just going to tell you. I wasn't going to tell you, but now I'm going to have to tell you. I've got a little bit of a cold, and so I'm going to take my mic off and have a good cough and then resume my message, okay? <laughs> I now. On, I'll just tell you to mute it next time. All right, we don't have to have that little moment. Um, and so, uh, uh, so I feel like uh, social media propagates this spirit of fear. I feel like twenty-four hour news propagates this spirit of fear. I feel like sometimes the news tells us the mo the news stories I think will make us the most scared. Uh, and, and so whether it's fear of, of failure or fear of the future, fear of what's going to happen with our country, fear of rejection, fear of related to our kids, fear of death, I, I think this fear thing is a big deal. And so over these next few weeks, we're, we're going to look at these stories. And, and, and here's the truth, anxiety, I was talking, there's a guy in my small group, he's a psychiatrist. And, and, and another one of my good friends is a psychologist. I've talked to these guys. And, and that uh, it studies show that at the holidays, our level of fear or anxiety tend to increase. I think some of that is the anxiety that's, that's surrounded by, by maybe increased family time or family isn't, um, isn't as healthy as maybe you wish it was. I, I think that the holidays specifically kind of uh, play on a couple of our primary fears. One of our fears is fear of being alone. And, and, and so if you find yourself, and, and nothing feels worse than being alone than being around a bunch of people and feeling alone. And, and many times people at the holidays, we have this desire, which is appropriate for closeness and connection and family. And community. And so I think this level of anxiety of this feeling of either I am alone or I feel alone is, is one of these bigger fears that we have. Another fear that we have, we were just talking about this fear of not having enough. I mean, do, will I be able to, to, to buy the people I love the gifts that I wish I could buy them? And so these, these levels of anxiety and fear, I think, are, are with us a lot of times in, in throughout the year, but can be heightened at the holidays. And so what we see, what I think is unique, is I, as we look at these uh, passages, is these four different occasions, these angels show up with these different people. We see Zechariah, we see Mary, we see Joseph, we see the shepherds. In each occasion, the, the people are scared to death, as you would be when an angel appears to you. That would be the normal response. You're, you're just kind of doing life, and now there's this giant angel in front of you. You have a m moment of fear, uh, and, and it's heightened in that, in that the, uh, in, in the uh, Old Testament, the idea is that if you encountered the presence of God or the messenger of God, that was going to many times be the last thing you saw. You thought, I'm going to surely, surely die. And so there's this, there's this fear that is natural when, when seeing an angel. But at the same time, each of these people ha had other fears that, that, that they were dealing with. And in each occasion, the angel speaks a, a word to calm the fears. And so when, I'm going to show you this today. So if you have your Bibles, go over to Luke chapter chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And what we see here in the gospel of Luke is as Luke starts his gospel um, showing us the, the events leading up to the birth of John the Baptist. Luke chapter 1. Let me show you this. It says, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. So you got these two people, both from the priestly line. Both of them love God or trying to do the right thing. But life hadn't gone the way they imagined. Verse 7, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. And so they had no kids, and now they're, they're in old age. 
And now while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So there was something like 18,000 priests. And, and so they, they would, by, by each uh, division of the priests, uh, they would um, draw lots, like cast dice for who was going to be the priest on duty that day. And it was typically kind of a once in a lifetime thing. And, and so this is Zechariah's once in a lifetime moment where he's going to be the one to, to go into the temple and, and offer the prayers. It says, uh, um, verse 10, and the whole multitude of the people, probably like 600 people, were outside praying and they're worshiping. They're, they, were out, they were praying outside at the hour of incense. Incense throughout the Old Testament kind of symbolizes prayers. And, and, and they appeared to him, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, as you would be. And fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Now, it's not simply a don't be afraid. And he doesn't simply say, don't be afraid, I'm not here to kill you. That would have been a reassuring, hey, don't be afraid, this isn't the day you die. But, but he says, don't be afraid, and he gives him the reason not to fear. Let me show this to you. Why? For your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. So what, what, Zachari- what the angel says to Zechariah is, hey, the reason that you shouldn't fear is because God's heard your prayer. And I want to talk to you today about how I, I believe that, that one of the big things that prayer does in our life is, is it eliminates the reason for fear. And so here's your first point. What prayer does is it acknowledges that God is at work more than we can see. So what God's about to do more in Zechariah and Elizabeth's life than they could ever imagine. And, and, and what we do when, we're, when we pray, what we do is we're recognizing that God is at work behind the scenes, that there's a bigger story than, than we see, and that he sees the bigger story. And so there's this moment, it would be the peak of, of Zechariah's life, this moment that he'd wondered, when's going to be my turn, probably just once in my lifetime, where I get to be the one to go into the temple and, and, and offer these prayers at this moment and this was his moment and as a man as just a, as just a man as as just a husband the prayer that Zechariah has probably been praying since soon after he got married is all that he wanted was that he and Elizabeth would one day have a baby that was their, his greatest desire. And he'd been praying that for, for much of their marriage, give us a baby. And, and there, was, there was this great stigma uh, culturally of childlessness, which would have caused Zachariah and Elizabeth to have a, a lot of fears. There would have been this fear of, has, had, has God forgotten me? Here he is. They, they, they tried to do the, the right thing. They, they tried to love God and said so they tried to live by the commands, and, and, but, but this, old, this the greatest dream of their life just hadn't come to pass, even though they tried to do the right thing. Maybe you've had a, a moment like that where the best you know, man, you're trying to put God first in every area of your life, but there's this great longing that you have and it just hasn't gone that way. And you begin to wonder, has God forgotten me? You begin to have this fear and, and then this fear that Zechariah would have had is, is God punishing me? In and, and the ancient world, there was this, this, this uh, great connection between children being a blessing and, and the lack of, of, of children many times being perceived as some sort of punishment from God, which is, is not right thinking, but it was the common thinking of the day. And, and so this idea that, that this fear that would have been kind of throughout as, as they were married not one year and then not five years and then not 10 years and 15 years and 20 years and these, this baby's not coming and then this thing, has God forgotten me or is God mad at me? Is he punishing me? It's, uh, have, I, have, has, have I missed out? He's at this moment where, where Zachariah and Elizabeth are, are, are old and past the age of, of childbearing and this feeling like, like, has time passed me by? You know, the thing is when you're, when you're really young, yeah, you can look forward and think, well, man, maybe things aren't so great now, but there's this moment where maybe it's going to all get better. And the truth is the older you get, the less looking forward you can do right? And, and this moment where you begin to say, well, man, well, the way it is may be the way it's going to be. Have I missed out? It, it's, it, it's it, where, it, where FOMO becomes ROMO. It's no longer the fear of missing out, it's the reality of missing out. 
And, and it's like, man, our kids are, I mean, we're, we're too old to have kids and what's going to happen? These fears. And, and this fear, which was based in reality that people would, would think less. People are, 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 people are, 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 are talking about me saying, well, I wonder what he did or she did to cause them to not have a baby. And, and there was this shame that came along with, with barrenness. And, and then also this idea, there was this pressure, if you were of a priestly family, that, that you would, would, would have a son that could then one day be a priest and to kind of keep the family line going that way. And then this fear, which is legitimate, which is, well, who's going to take care of me when I'm old? You guys ever look at your kids and like say, you know, we've got the three girls, right? And, and so, you know, and, and I kind of have an idea of who might be best to take care of us when we're old. <laughs> now, I have an idea of who might make the most money to fund our old age. So I've had talks like, hey, if you want to be more hands-on, and then, hey, and if you want to fund it, you know, kind of, you ever like think, who's going to take care of us when we're old? But they're kind of, they're thinking those thoughts and there weren't assisted livings like we have today. And there weren't social security, you know, payments and, and all those things to take care of old people like we have today. And there weren't 401ks and retirements. Kids just took care of their parents when they got old. And, and so Zachariah and Elizabeth have this fear of what's going to happen to us. What's going to happen to us when we can't take care uh, of ourselves? And so it, it, his whole life, ever since he was married, there's been this prayer over and over and over again. When are we going to have a baby? And, and so this, this, the angel shows up and, and he says, do not be afraid. Why? Your prayer has been heard. What the angel's saying is he's saying God is up to more than you realize. And he, and he says, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Normally, it would be common to, to name the son after, after the father, but this word John, it means God is gracious, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Why? For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. What, what the angel's describing is what's called a Nazarite vow, where people for a period of time would, would commit to just kind of focus on God, kind of like a hyper version of fasting, where, where they would say, hey, we're going to focus this period of time on God, and, and, and we're not going to consume any alcohol, and, and we're not going to shave our face or cut our hair. And typically it was for a season of time, but, but for John, it was going to be a, a lifetime thing. It will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And so as, as a man, John's, I mean, uh, Zachariah's whole life, he would have been praying, God, just give us a baby. But then as, as a Jew and as a priest, he would have been praying over and over because there was this great expectation that the Messiah was going to come soon. And so the, the last words we see in the, the book of Malachi is this idea of, of this spirit of Elijah, this someone coming in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way. And so this angel saying, hey, your son, the one that you've waited for your whole life, he's going to be the one that prepares the way for the Messiah. And, and so Zechariah, I don't know what he was praying when he was in that, that, that temple in that moment. Maybe he was praying, just taking a moment and having a little selfish prayer of just, God, we still want to have a baby even though it's we're too old and it would take a miracle or or maybe he was praying for the messiah maybe he was saying god when are you going to send the savior and then this angel shows up and, and and zachariah is scared to death and and the angel says don't be scared and the reason not to be scared is because god has heard your prayers both of those big prayers that you've prayed over and over and over again one that you would have a baby and two that the messiah would come he says you're going to have a baby and this baby's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. Your prayers have been answered. And so when we pray, what we're doing is, is we're recognizing, we're acknowledging that God is at work more than we can see. What this angel's saying is he's saying, God's heard your prayer and he's answering in a bigger way than you could ever have expected or realized. Here's the next thing. What prayer does is it deals with the root of our fears, which is our need to be in control. Now, I, I don't know about you, but just the, 
If you, I don't know what your journey and, and, and your family's been in terms of having kids, but, but, but our experience, Claire and I, was, quickly showed us that we're not in control of how this is all going to go down. Claire and I were married about three months when, uh, when Claire got pregnant with, with our oldest daughter, Lauren. It was the surprise of the century. <laughs> she took a test, and then we didn't believe that, that home bot test, and then we went to a hospital, we, did free, we saw a free test, we're like, well, let's go take another one there, because we didn't believe the first one, because she was supposedly on birth control, telling me she was taking it every day. Now I know <laughs> she doesn't do anything every day, and so, uh, <laughs> and so, so we had Lauren, which was a great blessing, and, and, uh, <laughs> And then we decided we waited a couple of years and have some more kids. And we waited a couple of years and then started trying and then nothing was happening. And then nothing was happening. And two years turned into four years, turned into five years. And we start going to see fertility doctors. And they're like telling us and this. And, and, and it was like we, we thought about doing some extreme fertility stuff. And we were like, we, number one, we couldn't afford it and weren't sure what we thought about it all. And so we just were like, ah, I guess we'll. And then, bam, just and then we got pregnant with Hannah. And, and it's like, wow, if, not, if that the experience doesn't show you, trying to, you know, time how your kids all go. Some people it goes like clockworks, other people it doesn't. But it's one of those things in life that just reminds you, I'm not really in control. And, and, and that's what's happening. So much of our fears are, are, are really at the root of it is we're, we're scared and, because we desire to have this feeling of control. And what happens here with Zechariah and Elizabeth is they get this reminder of how little control they have and that they, their whole life they've been trying to have this baby. It doesn't happen the way, the way they think or when they think. And, and now they're super old and not even expecting it. And now it's going to happen. But then we see this even bigger reminder. Go back. Let me show you in Luke chapter 1 verse 18. Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? I think that's awesome. I love these moments in the Bible where someone is, you know, you think that the fact that there's a giant angel standing in front of you saying it's going to happen would be enough. You know, it's like, well, how am I going to know? I mean, I know that you're a giant angel telling me, but how still, how else am I going to know? <laughs> For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. This is a pre-Viagra situation. And uh, <laughs> laugh with me, folks. I thought that was funny. And uh, <laughs> If that was inappropriate, it could be the cold medicine talking. Um, <laughs> and the angel, and send the emails to, just don't send them. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And so what's happening is now Zechariah in just, a, in just an instant is going from the highlight of his life, this moment where, where, where he's like the most important person in all of Israel, and that he's the, the one that's offering these prayers in this moment. It's his, his moment to do the priestly duties. And, and then now that all that control is, is ripped away from him, where now he can't even speak. The thing is, if you're a priest, speaking is a big part of the deal. And, and so he, he, and then we also get evidence later in the story that he also couldn't hear. It says when they were talking to him about what to name him, they were making signs to him as if he also couldn't even hear. And so, so he, he can't speak and he can't hear. There, he's at full and complete total loss of control. Have you ever had a moment like that where you just realized, I, I don't have any control over what's going on right now? And, and really, the, what, what con all control ever is, is an illusion. Whenever you think you're in control, you just are, you just, it's, a, it's, a, it's an illusion. It's, I think I'm in control. Whenever you think that you have security, it is simply an illusion. And, and, and so what prayer does is, is prayer deals with the root of our fears. It's this need to be in control where we recognize I'm really not in control. And the moments where I realize I'm not in control, I'm not in control. And in the moments where I think I am in control, I'm still not in control. That, that, that we, we just don't, we don't have, we don't have certainty. We don't have certainty our heart's going to beat another second. We don't have certainty a plane's not just going to crash into this room, right? We don't, we don't know. And, and, and so much of our fear is, 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 this, is when we realize that, that we're not in control. And it's, uh, 
It, it's the fear of what people think about us. We can't control it. Fear of the future, we can't control it. Fear of what's going to happen with our kids, we can't control it. And what prayer does is it embraces the fact that I am not in control, and it yields these things to God. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 5. Let me show this to you. See, really, when I go through life believing I'm the one in control, it's the essence of pride. I'm going through life thinking that I, I'm the one that's got it all, all in control. I'm the one. And really, this is pride. Let me show you this. 1 Peter 5, verse 6. It says, humble yourselves. Now, right before that, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, when I go through life thinking I'm in control as opposed to God, it's pride. When I go through life recognizing God's in control, not me, it's humility. Look at verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. See, so many times, the reason we live in fear is that we don't humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. We humble ourselves under our circumstances. We hum humble ourselves under the opinions of others. We hum humble ourselves un under all of our fears. When the answer is to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God so that at the right time he may exalt you. But look here at verse 7. How do we do it? Tells us next. How do we humble ourselves? We cast all of our anxieties on him, all of our fears on him, all of our worries on him. Why? Because he cares for you. And, and so the essence of pride is I think I'm in control. The essence of humility is I acknowledge God's in control. And the way I live that out, Peter says, is that we cast our cares on him. The things you're scared of, the things you're worried about, the things you're anxious about, that you give it to him. It's this recognizing of he's in control, I'm not in control. It deals with this root issue. Here's the third thing. Prayer invites God's presence to calm our Fears. We go back and, and look at that story here in Luke chapter 1. He says, how am I going to know this? How am I going to know this? And, and the angel, verse 19, says, I am Gabriel. He says, I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Gabriel says, I, I, man, I just was with the, the Father, and, and I'm here as his representative. I, I'm here with you, and I, I'm bringing you this good news news. Here's the thing. When we pray, what we're doing is we're, we're saying, God, I'm not in control. You are. God, I need you. And then what happens, the Bible tells us, is that when his presence calms our fears. Let me show this to you. Go over in Philippians chapter 4. Let me show this. Philippians chapter 4. And God does not want you to go through life filled with fear. It, it is, I believe that Christians going through life scared and panicked and anxious it, it is, is one of the, the worst testimonies that, that as Christians, we should go through life filled with peace and courage. And, and, and that's the thing. The prayer deals with these fears. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Let me show this to you. Well, I love the last part of verse 5. It says, the Lord is at hand. And in, in light of that, do not be anxious. And so again, it's God's, the fact that God's near. Do not be anxious or do not be worried or do not be fearful about anything. You don't have to be fearful about the economy. You don't have to be fearful uh, about who's in the White House or who's in the Congress. You don't have to be fearful uh, uh, about your health. You don't have to be fearful about, do not be fearful about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. But don't, don't, don't be scared, he says, but pray. And then what happens when you pray? And then, and the peace of God, this absence of worry, this absence of anxiety, this absence of fear, this confidence that God's in control and it's going to all be okay. And the peace of God, and I love this next phrase, which surpasses all understanding. Have you ever had a moment in your life where, where all, the, everything was in a shambles around you and the circumstances were terrible and you had no reason at all to have peace, that the natural response would be to panic because things were bad. 
The natural response would be epic fear because things were terrible. But in that moment, God gave you peace. It's the peace. It's, it's peace when it doesn't even make any sense to have peace. That's what Paul says happens when we take our anxieties and our fears and turn them into prayer that we invite God's presence to bring peace. It says, in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Prayer invites God's presence to calm our fears. One of the primary marks of the Christian life is peace and courage. And Christians should be the least fearful people on the planet. Christians should be the least fearful people on the planet. And here's the last thing, we're done. Prayer invites God's power to act on the things that frighten us. Just gonna finish off this story here, and it's verse 21. The people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. They thought maybe he died. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. They had realized he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. What we see here in this story is Zach and the, Zachariah and Elizabeth were facing what seemed like an impossible situation. The desire of their heart was to have a baby. And, and they were in the natural that was not going to happen. Now, now they knew enough to know the stories in the Old Testament where, where there were people that faced an impossible situation and that God did a miracle and that God came through and that, that, that God changed everything. And, and they'd, they knew the stories of, of, of people like Sarah, Abraham's wife, who, who was old and old, and God said, you'll have a baby, even though she was too, way too old to do it. And then God came through, and then God did something bigger than she could ever have imagined. And they knew the story of Hannah, who desperately wanted to have a baby, and then it wasn't happening, and it wasn't happening, and it wasn't happening, and then God came through. They, they knew the stories over and over and over again through the Old Testament, how, how people facing something that felt impossible, it was bigger than them, and, and that God came through, not only in, in giving peace, sometimes that's how God comes through. Sometimes God, God doesn't change our circumstance, but he changes us in the midst of our circumstance, and he gives us this peace that passes understanding. The apostle Paul, he had this ailment that he asked over and over and over. He said, God, would you take it from me? Would you take it from me? Would you take it from me? And then, and then finally, God said, hey, you know what? He says, I'm not going to take it from you, but I'm going to be with you in it. I'm, I, my grace is sufficient for you. When, you're, when you are weak, I am strong. Sometimes that's how it goes, but then sometimes God actually changes the things that are the source of our fears. We see ourselves facing these impossible situations, and then God comes in and changes the things that cause our fear. And so I don't know what's going on with you. And I don't know if it's something going on in, in your family. I don't know if the prospect, maybe you're just scared to death of having your family at your house at Christmas. The thing is, sometimes that's kind of funny, but man, sometimes it's just real, right? Sometimes it's just real. And, and, or maybe there's, there's big stuff going on in your family, and you say, man, if something doesn't happen in our marriage, man, I don't know that we're going to still be married next Christmas. Maybe there's a child that that relationship with you and them isn't what you wish, or maybe there's something going on in your finances, and maybe you're saying, man, Pastor Dave, I'll, I'll take a couple of gift cards, but that's not going to solve our problem. Maybe it's big. Maybe there's something going on in your health, and, and you feel like, man, it's, it's, these things are causing real fear. And, and I, I just want you to know that, that you, you don't have to live that way. And, and that as you take these fears, as you recognize, as you, as you humble yourself, which is recognizing God's in control and I'm not, you humble yourself, and then you cast your cares on him why? Because he cares for you. Recognizing that, that, that I'm not in control and that he's in control, what we do is that we then invite his presence to come and take away the fear, and we invite his power to deal with those things that we're most frightened of. Let me pray for you. Hey, after the service, uh, we're going to make sure we've got a few extra folks here in the front. If you need prayer for anything, and there's folks that would love to pray for you. If you need prayer 
for your health or your family or your finances, maybe something going on inside of you emotionally. God, if you, that if, if you need prayer, we've got people that would love to pray for you after the service. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us, God, to remember that you didn't give us a spirit of fear or trepidation. Lord, but that from you comes a spirit of power and a spirit of love and a spirit of a sound mind. Lord, I pray that for all of us, God, that, that we wouldn't be people that, whose lives are marked by fear, but that we'd be people whose, whose lives are, are marked by power and love and a sound mind, that our lives would be marked by peace and by courage. And God, that when fear comes, God, that we would take it to you in prayer, recognizing you're in control and we are not, and recognizing that you care for us. Lord, knowing that you are strong and powerful to change what's going on inside of us and give us your peace that goes beyond understanding and to change what's going on around us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Guys, have a great week and God bless you.